right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us today for the next uh, FlexoKite White Ink webinar. Just to give you a few practical things before we get started. Uh, everyone's on mute, so we can avoid background noise. What you'll see is on the right hand side of your screen are a couple of tabs. One is if you want to ask a question during the webinar, you can type it in there and we'll see that and we can answer that for you. The other is that the webinar is being recorded. So shortly after the webinar ends, you'll automatically get a link uh, to go back and have a look at the webinar if you want to. And if you have any audio or video problems during the webinar, just refresh your browser. That's all you need to do. So we started these webinars as like an interactive series for problem solving and, and looking at solution-based sessions for the industry on a lot of different topics. And we really look at it as a ask the expert philosophy uh, to be either troubleshooting or really introduce new innovations that's coming out in the industry. And this webinar itself is actually a direct response to the first White Ink webinar that we did was people were asking if you're trying to do something with different screen patterns or different analog volumes, how do you put those two things together? And all the web, all the sessions can be seen uh, on demand as well. So just to give you a quick rundown on the flexible kites, uh, we have two demo centers, one in uh, the Netherlands and one in India, uh, fully equipped to take PDF to print, uh, also to provide analog education and print support, uh, technology showroom and to give people uh, product demos and training. So in this webinar, we're gonna really look at how do we start to map different surface patterns with different analog screens, with different print speeds, with different types of ink, and how do these things fit together as we're trying to really optimize white ink itself for flexible packaging. Our speakers today are Wolfgang Spreer, he's a manager of the Technology Center at Wimble and Holscher. We also have Nick Harvey, Technical Director from Apex International. Uh, I'm actually going to be filling in for Robert Bruce this morning uh, from ESCO because he got stuck uh, on a flight. <laughs> As we're, everything's opening back up from COVID, it's kind of funny that uh, we get to experience these things now. And then lastly, we have Colin Smith from Sun Chemical, who's the European Product Manager. Today, the things we're going to go through uh, as part of the webinar is to focus on white ink and opacity. Uh, how do we measure that? How do we evaluate white ink? Looking at the spec from the project and the details. Then we'll look at, uh, hear from Wolfgang about the Novoflex press we actually used for the uh, print trials. From Nick about how we uh, decided which analogs to use. From some chemical who's been developing some new inks to use with white ink. Uh, looking at some different screen patterns, and then we're going to round everything off looking at the results from 36 different print tests. And when you look at white ink in flexible packaging, it's a critical part for a lot of different types of products, whether they're baby products, uh, bread, cleaning products, uh, different types of multi-packs, all of these things, the white plays a really critical role. That's not only in the quality that's being produced, uh, but it's also in the cost of producing those different types of packaging. And what you also see is if we have multi-packs and we wanna make sure that if somebody's gonna scan that at a register, that if the white was really weak, they might scan the single pack instead of the actual barcode for the multi-pack. So all these things become really, really important. And when you look at white ink itself, it's interesting to see what people say. It's actually the least expensive ink that we buy, and that might be the case if you look at it per kilo, but it also, for a lot of converters, is the ink that they spend the most amount of money on in their production. And when you start to look at white ink, it's actually important to go beyond just an opacity measurement or an opacity value because there's different aspects of the white that we'll go into in more detail to really show just an opacity measurement is not really giving you the right amount of information to really evaluate the quality of the white. And when you look at doing a, a measurement for white opacity, it's really about measuring the white over a black solid and then a white reference. And you can use devices like the X-Rite Exact 
to calculate an opacity value. It's not that hard to do. Most people have this equipment available, but you probably might not have it next to the press every time you're running production. So it's also looking at how do you continually evaluate and measure that white opacity. When you start to look at white ink, there's two things to take a look at. One is the opacity value and the ink weight that you're actually producing. But the other thing is the homogeneity of the ink. How smooth is it actually laying down on that substrate? How much is it blocking out the background that we want to get rid of when we're using the white ink? And what you can start to see is as people increase the ink weight or increase the amount of ink they're putting down, they can start to actually improve what they might have as pinholes or something else showing up within the white. But they also start to maybe not always affect the opacity the way that they think they would. And that's one of the things we're going to go into in a lot more detail uh, later on in the webinar. And the last thing is to look at if we're trying to achieve a really high quality result, the quality of that white, the homogeneity of the white can play a huge role in the quality of the final printed products, but also comparing that to how does that impact our cost of producing that piece of packaging? So now we're going to come to the first poll question. And what you'll see is this pop up on the right hand side of your screen. And what we want to do is get some feedback from you about how you're working in your environment. And you can also see results coming back from everyone else. So it's a really interesting way to get, you know, everyone more involved in the webinars as well. So when you look at white opacity, it's long been viewed as a lot of coverage helps a lot. So we think the more white we can put down, the better. But the question we have is, how do you actually evaluate your white? Do you actually only look at it visually? Are you using a densitometer or some kind of house standard you compare that to? Are you doing spectral measurements or we don't really cover that or we don't really do it in a, in a specific way? All right, so let's have a look. Really interesting as we see everyone filling in the poll. Nice to see a lot of people actually doing spectral measurements of the whites. Uh, really important. We'll just give a couple more minutes for people to fill in the question. Okay, if we look now, there's a lot of people that are really only looking at the white visually on the press. I guess not surprising that uh, it's not always easy to do those measurements on every job in production. Equal amount of people doing spectral measurements and equal amount of people looking to like a house standard. Wow, thanks. That's really good to see. So now I wanted to give you a little bit more details about the project spec and the details of what we were doing when we produced these different print samples. So we went through and really tried to validate all of the parameters with the co-suppliers and the technical experts that have been taking part to ensure we had a really scientific way to go through and evaluate the, the final results of everything. And we wanted to look at consistency, repeatability, and have a control step for each part of the process. So we had the press requirements within controlled environments, the analogs requirements, uh, the surface patterns that were produced, and then the ink, all coming back as part of this project. So right now I'm gonna hand over to Wolfgang you can uh, give a short introdu introduction of himself and he'll take you through the next set of slides. Hey, good morning uh, together. My name is Wolfgang Spreel from WH in Lengerich. I'm 48 years old and in uh, since 30 years uh, in the flexo packaging business. Since 11 years I have uh, um, the responsibility from the technical center of the Windmill and Hölscher for printing. And I'm happy about the invitation. Thank you for the Flexotype team to be a part of this results today. So Flexo performance. We know the discussion is low performer, high performer, but what is performance? Let's start to take a look on the word performance. What is it? 
Performance refers to how well a person or a machine does a piece of work or an activity. So what is output, what is uh, the situation, and uh, one of different situations to measure it, to document it or have it in a uh, different systems, uh, each one from you have different uh, ideas to measure this, but we follow um, the philosophy from three different uh, values, availability, performance and quality. Availability means we want to produce without breakdowns, no unplanned interruptions, the press have to run, we have to earn money. Performance is when it is running, uh, we want to have the maximum speed. But when we want to have the maximum speed, we get limitations in maybe in quality. And these three values is a summary of a uh, possible uh, translation in overall equipment effectiveness uh, to see what is the value from my press or my whole setup. And only the press is a small part. It's uh, the fruitful discussion with uh, the system partners from Plate, from Anilux, from Dr. Blades, from Ink Systems, Cushion Tapes, whatever. And when all participants make a well job, you can achieve this three values on the maximum values. So we want to reduce setup times when we have to have setups, so job quantities are decreasing more and more. So not the maximum speed is uh, the maximum uh, uh, target. It could be that for a lot of customers is the reduced setup time important. But in additional, we need um, more um, a high focus on breaks and planned or unplanned shutdowns, interruptions. We want to have higher speed productions and we want to have the maximum quality with reduced startup waste and reduced production waste. So um, I'm jump not in all these details now, but what we from WH sites uh, think that uh, the key factors for uh, this three maximum values is you need a powerful drying system. We need an accurate winding system. You need fast setup modules. You don't have printing settings uh, by hand or register settings by hand uh, since a lot of years. Uh, you need it uh, automatically. You need a strong and stiff printing unit uh, to have bounce free productions with uh, high screen lines counts, with bars, with screens, with pictures, whatever. Um, and uh, overall, you need perfect handling. Because what is when you have here a Formula One racer and the guys cannot make in this short time so much activities or you uh, have only one up to two guys per presses. Uh, I think a uh, small quantity of companies use uh, more than two guys per presses and so you we have from a development side from the presses uh, the target for handling and now i jump in in the inking system and this is for this discussion today why the right discipline let me say for this what we want to uh, we use for this the TurboClean Advanced E. We have three different generations and uh, um, levels of TurboClean. TurboClean is the whole word for our inking system from the ink bucket uh, into the cell of the Anilox roller to transfer it on the plate and so on. And uh, here is now the TurboClean uh, E uh, on the right, uh, one page back, sorry. Um, um, the Turbo Clean E means we have E-Pumps. Uh, with this um, E-Pumps, we can increase the availability uh, extreme because the diaphragm or membrane pumps um, are, have not a long, a long time, a li lifetime uh, over uh, the whole year. And uh, with the Turbo Clean E, uh, you have uh, big advantages and get better cleaning, printing, uh, cleaning the results, have lower maintenance uh, for the pumps. 
and um, we can increase the performance why then uh, we have a fully integrated viscosity system so not a separate system what uh, is in his world uh, in all pro control uh, activities you can uh, write down and uh, have a uh, library to see exactly in which second was which accident or which uh, influence on which ink deck and a massive uh, um, point is the continuous and pulsation free ink flow because the diaphragma pump have always pulsations and so on. The next is the turbo clean uh, turbo seal. The turbo seal is a new development um, with the sealing area. We can uh, reduce wearing on the seals and the doctor blades. We have a very fast changing. Um, from the doctor blades uh, during the setting. Um, we can uh, increase the uh, performance because when you have lower actions on ceilings and doctor blades, you have longer production runs. And you get higher quality because the homogeneous ink across the web at any speed is an impact. Additional, the ink cooling system is helpful. Um, when you are around the world with temperatures over 25 and 30 degrees, you have always movings in your conditions and when with constant conditions, you are on the right way. The ink consumption measurement is important. There is a, a closed loop from our side when uh, the opacity, for example, or the spot colors, whatever, um, have to document uh, how, what was the consumption per thousand meter, per thousand feet, per square meter, whatever. We have here a scale on each ink bucket and we can see what is helpful uh, for printing to the last drop, warning before the color is empty, um, prepare so much ink like just needed, not so much as you will have, put to, to the press what you need up to the last drop, save money in case of remaining inks and uh, find out the best setting what is now the best uh, values to earn money and at least higher quality so the, the circle is closed now uh, from our side for the oee uh, you need an inking system and the inking system is an extreme important key uh, component uh, to achieve uh, maximum availability, performance and quality. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the invitation and I'm open for questions later. Thanks. Okay, that's gonna take us on to poll question number two. An interesting thing that we see coming back with uh, talking to different customers is what are you trying to actually achieve as your wide opacity? What's the standard you need to hit? Uh, is that 48 to 52% opacity? Something higher, say 53 to 56? Or really demanding customers that say, we want to have a wide opacity over 56%. It could be also that you say, we don't really have a fixed standard. It, it kind of changes. So let's take a look at what we see showing up in the poll question itself. Give everyone a little bit of time to fill that in. Again, we always like to use these poll questions. It's, it's interesting to, to always see what are other people in the industry doing? You know, what are their requirements? How do we fit in? Are we an outlier? Do, do we do something much more demanding or we're, we're in line with everyone else? And if we start to look at the results now, we see a lot of people with a very, very high standard for whites, over 56%. Uh, it's, it's tough to hit. And while we'll, you know, we'll show you the results we had as well earlier. Uh, quite interesting to see this coming in. Thanks, everybody. So let's just wait. Still a couple votes coming in. Yeah, we still see a very high standard. So we'll move on to the next section now, and I'm going to hand over to Nick. Uh, from Apex to tell us a little bit more about the analogs. Nick? Okay, hi, I'm uh, Nick Harvey, Technical Director for Apex International. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank both uh, Wolfgang, W&H, and Colin, and Sun Chemicals for participating in this uh, in this uh, project. It's um, this, this was the second 
webinars, as Dan mentioned. The first one was a case study. From that case study came the question of, uh, can you map the um, analog volume or analog um, spec to the surface pattern? And we've done that and we've delivered. Uh, listening to Wolfgang's presentation there where they can measure uh, the weight and usage of, of white opacity. Uh, the next stage, if there is an interest from the industry, will be um, we've we've proven that we can map the uh, map the surface pattern to the analogs, which we'll show you later. And um, if the interest is there from the industry, we can do the validation uh, aspect project, which would be put put a design in and do this. Um, direct comparison of volume versus surface pattern and, uh, and and get real saving data so just something to think about and if you uh, if you want to put that in the questions at the end or uh, come through we will we will deal with that but um, let me get back to my area of speciality which is which is analogs so when we came to this project uh, we wanted to look at how we could get um, the most consistent results and with analux itself, there are a lot of uh, things to understand, and hopefully this uh, this short presentation will give you um, uh, some more data as opposed to just numbers and lines per inch and lines per centimeter. So the basic uh, to try and understand the difference between um, analux volume and uh, an ink transfer. So analux volume is is purely and simply how much space is within those cells. So how much ink falls in when it's full and gets straight off, that is your analog volume. That's the very different to ink transfer, because in basic terms, that is how much ink is made available to the plate surface in production and production speeds, and how receptive is both the plate to the ink and then the substrate that you're printing onto to, to that ink. So it's, uh, these are two very, very different uh, aspects. And we looked at these to try and uh, understand which was the fairest and best engraving to evaluate the surface patterns of, uh, and the performance of the opacity. So we'll come on to the next. So our choices were, we were gonna go either hexagonal standard cells or, or the GTT wave. Uh, and we based the decision on control repeatability, which I'll explain as we go through now. So as an understanding, H16 engravings, you can have a multiple of different volumes from the same lines per inch or lines per centimeter. And below are just some guide uh, values that are you have the potential to buy or, or we, we manufacture along with our competitors. So if we look at a 120 lines per centimeter analog, you can have that with any uh, volume in between 5 and 14.5 uh, centimeters cubed, uh, which is equal to, depending if you're in the US or somewhere else, uh, 300 lines per inch with a volume of 3.2 BCM to 9.4. So these targets are what we as as Apex, as a, as a manufacturer of Analux, say that this is, this is a um, realistic range of volumes that you can get from these these engravings. We can, of course, go lower. We can, of course, go higher. But there are risks associated with doing both of those things, which uh, which we can discuss at a later date. So numbers are one thing. It's wonderful. But uh, what does it actually look like to give you uh, an idea of what you're purchasing or what you're requesting? So if we look at the uh, 120 lines per centimeter, the numbers that we've just discussed, a 120 with five centimeters cubed is gonna look something like those images on the left. Very, very shallow. If you look at the little purple uh, pins on the top, you can do very little polish on these uh, on this engraving because if you do, uh, you, you go uh, too low and, and you start having other problems. So um, that's the kind of image and kind of cell that you would get from a 120 with five Conversely, if you look on the right-hand side, you've got 120 with a 14.5. And I call this kind of shape is more like a witch's hat. So it's uh, more pointy. It's got less of an opening. And um, yeah, the ink transfer percentage from 
the one on the right and the one on the left quite clearly is going to be different. You're going to transfer more uh, with an open cell and, uh, and a better shaped cell than you are with a very pointy um, analog uh, engraving that's on the right. And if you also go even further, so if you went to 15, 16 cubic centimeters, which the lasers can do, what you will end up with is, yes, a theoretical volume that is, uh, that is a number, but you're not going to transfer much more than you would get out of the 14.5. And it will become a far more expensive role uh, from a cleaning aspect because you would have to clean more often. So, again, uh, 120 at this, I've, I've just gone through and, and discussed this. The ink transfer characteristics is a percentage. People always say, what, what, what percentage do you transfer through the process? Well, I think when you look at surface patterns that came in probably 10 years ago, if not uh, a little bit longer, um, from the same plate with a different surface pattern, you can get uh, anything on a, if, if we talk on, on a color like a magenta, you can get anything from 1.4 density to 1.8 or 1.9 density based on exactly the same analogs. So it's very difficult to, to just put a number of what transfer you get from the analogs alone because you've got all the other process parameters that can have an effect. So coming back to, uh, to the white and again our decision. Um, this is what you can get if you keep the volume exactly the same. So this is 11 cubic centimeters. You can get those safely from an engraving aspect from a 120 lines per centimeter right the way through to a 180 and anything in between but again you've got a measured theoretical volume of 11 but you're not going to transfer that same amount through the process because of the cell shape so when we're looking at trying to map a surface pattern that is reliant on a ink transfer or availability of ink that's coming to it the volume is not the only answer so it's very difficult to say, just give me an 11 volume and I can use surface pattern A or B and it will work because that 11 volume could be with a 120 or a 180 or a 170 or a 130. <clears throat> so there is no fixed standard point when we're looking at, uh, at the H60s. So if we go to the next. Difference with GTT is and this isn't uh, analog selling this is just to give you the uh, reasons for this decision is that uh, a gtt is a fixed profile it's based on the optimum shape so it's the optimum depth the optimum opening and the opt optimal polish on, on the surface and that is fixed so if you want an 11 volume gtt it is exactly the same. You cannot get uh, different depths, different heights, different openings. It's a fixed amount. So you're very, very consistent through this engraving and this technology that you will always get an analog that is the optimum for performance, cleanability, and consistency. Okay, next. So how does that look when we come to uh, getting back into, the, into this reason for the white and using a GTT engraving. Again, simply on the left, you've got opacity numbers going from 54 down to 44. So um, a 10 point drop, depending on what lines per centimeter you use. Whereas with the GTT, it really doesn't matter. An 11 volume is an 11 volume, it's fixed. So from the analog aspect alone, this was the obvious choice because that's a fixed parameter that isn't going to change and it's always the optimum, whichever volume you choose. So we created a banded analogs um, and we produced uh, the bands that you see there. So a seven volume, eight volume, 10, 11, and 14. Again, all based on this optimum shape, optimum cell, which is fixed. And this, is, um, this, is, this was the start point for having a controlled ink transfer um, aspect for this trial. All right, thanks, Nick. Now I'm going to hand over to Colin. Uh, Colin, if you want to give a, a short uh, introduction and then take us through uh, the critical parts for the ink side. Thanks, Dan. Uh, my name's Colin Smith. I've been involved in 
the technical aspects of flexible packaging and print for more than 30 years and I'm more than happy to contribute to this project. We think it's an important subject, uh, white printability in general as we move more and more from gravure to flexo, uh, white application is critical going forward. So thank you to Apex and ESCO uh, for setting all this up. Just to add to the complexities you all face, uh, you understand you know, from what Nick has said about the Analux, uh, there's a wide range of choice when it comes to your plates. The same is with the inks. We just add to your complexities uh, the standard inks out there, I don't quite know what that means, but the standard inks, there's high opacity variants, uh, there's lots of variation in chemistry, there's lots of variation in solvents, uh, we're managing a lot of different technologies, so you have nitrocellulose, uh, polyurethane, elastomeric materials, polyamide, PVB, polyurethane, so you have all this chemistry to manage. These inks do not empty the analogs or interact with the screen in the same way. They're all different. In most cases, you don't have a lot of choice on what chemistry you choose. The chemistry predominantly is defined by your end use application. Is it adhesive lamination? Is it extrusion lamination? Are you surface printing? Is it for retort applications? Is it snack food? Is it deep freeze? Is it collation wrap? Uh, the chemistry of the white is more or less always chosen with those aspects in mind. So it's not something you have inherently a lot of control over. The one thing you do have a lot of control over is the economics of the situation. Uh, and you know the economics really are governed by grams per square meter. So how much ink do you put on the substrate? And there's a lot of factors uh, given our final conclusion. As I said before, the ink type plays a big part. The analogs obviously chip plays a big part. And so does the plate screening. All those uh, help to deliver the ink to the substrate. Also, the substrate plays a part. So going forward, we really need to understand the relationship between opacity and coating weight. I think the print quality aspects and the lack of pinholes is a given. That's part of our job. But we need to understand whether opacity is just about adding more and more volume, either from the analog or the plate, or is it more about what we apply and how we apply it? I think that's what we're going to discuss in the next half hour. And that's the important part, I think, of today's session. With respect to the inks, I think Nick will talk about that were tested. Uh, two systems were run, uh, a polyurethane system, which was the high opacity variant, and an NCPU system, which was the standard product. Thank you. Thanks, Colin really interesting to, to get that, that feedback. Uh, so now let's move on to poll question number three. So we know that people, when they're trying to hit their standard or, or the customer requirements in production, it's not always simple if, you, if you're not getting there. So the question is, is what's your go-to solution to improve the white, to get that standard that you need? Is that move to a higher volume analogs? Is that to move to a harder tape? reduce the print speed you, that way you can hopefully get a better coverage on the material or is it to try and change the ink and let's take a look at how everyone's responding to this question always interesting to get this feedback from you guys we really appreciate seeing that it's really interesting for us as suppliers to see how do people tackle the challenges they have every day in production it's not always simple. So we'll give people a couple of minutes to start to fill this in. It looks like now uh, 
for most companies, the standard solution is to go to a higher volume analogs. I guess it's 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 really not surprising because it's one of the easiest things to do in the production. Uh, and of course, if you have to reduce your print speed, that's going to also have a big impact on your overall production and make challenges day to day for what you're doing. Really interesting. Thank you, everybody. So now we're going to take a look at the surface screens. I'm going to fill in for Robert Bruce uh, to kind of give you some more detail about how this is all developing and, and, and what's been happening for surface screens. And we want to look at it from two perspectives. One is if you're a pre-media company and you have to supply lots of different converters. And the other is uh, if you're actually a printing company and, and you have to manage this yourself on press. I think when you go back and you look at the development of surface screens, uh, they've probably been around for at least 20 years. And there's been a lot of different developments. And in the beginning, I think surface patterns were created to just as here's something else we can create as a screen. We can hold it on a plate. Uh, we hope it'll give you the result that you want. And what you see is with this particular set of screens, these were developed specifically for white ink. Uh, why are they different? Well, because the white ink is slightly different than what you have in your normal process colors or you have in your PMS colors. And one of the challenges you see is if you're a trade shop, you might supply different printing companies that have different press types, that have using different plates, using different analogs, using different tapes, using different inks. How do we manage all of that? And one of the things that ESCO was working on is a very simple uh, set of screens to print and then a simple way to evaluate that single set of screens. Uh, and I think the interesting thing about what we want to show today is we actually, this is what in the first webinar, people came back and said, is there any way you can give us some guidance? Because this is an awful lot of work for somebody to try and undertake on their own. The other challenge is if you look at it from a converter perspective is I might have different machines in my machine park and I have standardized some of that. So I'm, I'm usually have one basic uh, ink that we go to and one type of tape that we try and do that. But we might have slightly different analog specs because all machines are not exactly the same. So again, the challenge is how do I know what's going to work easiest for me? I have a set of screens I can do, but if I have to do that testing uh, with different plate types on all my different presses uh, with different inks or, or different analogs, it's a huge challenge for people to try and, and work that out. And it's definitely been simplified. But our goal here today was to say, let's kind of do some of that groundwork for you to make that simpler. And really, it's about marrying up some of these things that come together. What we start to see coming out of this study uh, is really clear is you might not get the result that you want with a specific screen pattern and a specific analogs. But does that mean the analogs is bad? No. Does that mean the screen pattern is bad? No. Does it mean the white ink is bad? No. What you see is these things all kind of fall in line and fit together. And that's what we're going to show you right at the end of this is, is we, as we, as you adjust the play type or you adjust the screen pattern or you adjust the analog volume or you adjust the ink and the print speed, how do these all fit together? Because is there a golden solution? Not necessarily, because it really depends on your requirements. So that's the, the important starting point from this too. So right now, let's move on to the print trial itself. I'm going to hand back over to Nick. Uh, definitely thank you uh, to W&H for helping us with this, because uh, it, was, it was a massive task. Okay, hi. So now we come on to the crux of, uh, of, of of what we what we did. We we wanted to make it, as we said in the beginning, um, scientific. Make it um, uh, technical, and we could back it up with uh, with facts and knowledge. So the press and uh, and the environment that we had at W and H was fantastic. So we've uh, we we stated that. Um, inks and chemicals, we had uh, head technician on site 
uh, a W and H with both uh, systems, so that was fully controlled from this side. We had four different uh, plate types that were evaluated, so McDermott, Japont, Asai, uh, all with the same screen patterns, and then obviously we had a Kodak plate as well, which has its uh, its own surface patterns. Um, the analogs we discussed was the GTT for the reasons of of um, accuracy of ink transfer and consistency. Uh, the substrate was 30 micron um, OPP. And we actually did three speeds. We put two on here. We did 200, 400, and 600 meters per minute. Uh, we're showing today just the 200 and the 400. So again, just to give you uh, an idea, you've seen the banded analogs roll. Um, this is uh, one of the plates that we had made uh, at the plate vendor. So uh, again, getting the experts and the people who uh, have ownership of the of the technology themselves to to create the plate. Uh, the screens were supplied by uh, by Aresco. So again, um, nothing left to chance. Everything was uh, followed through um, accurately. This is a bit of an overview. It, it's, a, it's a little bit of a snapshot, but if where you look at green, green is everything above 50 and uh, opacity. And if you look down the left side, you've got a seven volume, eight volume, 10, 11, and 14. And what you can see at 200 meters a minute, and we'll come on to some more visuals shortly, is that um, all of those analog volumes with the high pigmented ink that Colin mentioned previously gave the 50%. So that's, that's one of the targets with uh, certain areas of packaging. So even from a seven volume analogs roll, we could get uh, the 50%. When the speed went up, obviously the dynamics changed slightly uh, from the transfer aspect. And what we find from there is that with a screen pattern, uh, pattern what we're calling as J, um, ESCO got a far more technical name for it, but uh, for this purpose, we call it J. We got uh, the 50% with a 10, 10 volume. So again, numbers are wonderful and uh, I'm a very visual person. So what does it actually actually look like? So um, we had around uh, nine different surface patterns and we also had just a plain old solid. So what you can see here, this is um, the 200 meters per minute. Uh, this one was a McDermott plate and um, the plain solid on its own with the parameters that we set out in the beginning gave uh, this kind of pinhole effect. Um, pattern G was better um, and increased it slightly, but pattern J pretty much was very closed as, as a surface. So uh, pattern J was uh, came out on, on top for the uh, C7. Again, with the eight, you see that the slightly less pinholes, which will be demonstrated side by side after, uh, as, we, as we go through the slides. Again, pattern G and pattern J were the um, were the standout uh, surface patterns that showed the the best transfer and the most uh, homogeneous transfer. Again, step by step, but you, you can clearly see again less less pinholes with the ten volume. There's more ink be made available to the process and to the plate uh, so we're getting less pinholes but they're still there uh, and pattern J again that same pattern is your um, standout uh, surface pattern. Crepto 211 again same pretty much the samey uh, and to 14 there you see what was indicated by the the pole when you do put a whole lot more volume of an analog down you are going to mask those um, pinholes and you're going to get a better better opacity. Um, the problem is that one, it's going to cost you much more money for certain because you're putting a thicker layer of ink down. Uh, and two, you potentially, depending on your on your press, whether it's new, old or what, what manufacturer, uh, you can bring yourself into drying issues. And uh, again, coming back to solvents and, and how the viscosity is, all the complexities that we've discussed, the more ink you throw at it, the more risk that you would have to run the press at a slower speed in order to get the correct drying. So let's look at just the plain solids to go through what we said there. You've got seven, eight, 
10 through to through to 14 very clear you just see that slowly step by step creeping the volume up you reduce the pinholes um as we just said but here's the interesting one pattern j on its own um this was yeah didn't matter which gtt analog she put it on uh whether it was the 14 the 11 10 8 7 this one was the best and the most closed all the way through and at all of those volumes so that's seven volume to 14 you were getting an opacity of uh, 50 percent at uh, this speed so when we're looking at mapping the surface patterns to an analogs if you go back to my presentation a little is that right when the analogs ink transfer percentages are correct and consistent because that's what you're getting from uh, from these engravings then this surface pattern is appears from the control testing that we've done to be the go-to uh, go-to surface pattern so um this was again uh, i think that we got the wrong it shouldn't be 200 it should be 400 uh, meters per minute on this one um but go on to the next one then. yeah so again you see uh the the pattern j we've got g in the in the 10 volume there was not a great deal of difference between g and j uh, but g just gave that extra um i think 0 0.2 on on opacity um but again you see that it's much more closed the opacity is dropped due to due to speed um that that's clear but you're still very closed and very uh, homogeneous so your your foundation for the print for any image that you're printing on there uh, whether it be a baby whether it be a packet of crisps you know when you've got a good solid foundation that image and that design is going to be enhanced that's uh, that's clear so what do we get from uh, from a conclusion uh, when we've done this and focused into it we we understand that the white ink is the biggest cost for sure uh, it's on most jobs and it's the biggest volume analogs roll that you use generally and it's it's used across um, all many aspects of, uh, of, of of printing and when you when you look at what does your customer ask for he doesn't ask for a um a, a white ink coat weight he just asks for an opacity so if you can achieve that opacity by putting less ink down then that's basically saving you money apologies to colin and some chemicals for the statement but in reality you know this is uh, flexo and we're trying to improve uh in, improve the process and uh and, and give give uh, good knowledge i would say that from uh from a logical side you know the first testing that we did was a customer case study uh that there's a webinar that you can uh, you can download on demand that led us into this one for the mapping when you look at the data that we've shown today um, and it's been done by the experts in their field for this uh, for the products that we've we've highlighted so again it's not just a single uh, company saying this is the right way when you look at the theory behind it that if you can get this an adequate opacity from seven volume analogs roll that you can from a 14 the theory states that you will save money okay the reality is, is that the case? Because you're transferring more from the seven than you were from the from the 14, and the percentages are different. That will be the next test. So we've basically proved, in theory, that you can get the same opacity by using a lower volume analog roll. Does that translate into ink saving? Again, that is something that we need to validate and have as uh, the next test. If there's, that is an interest to the um uh, to the to the converters and people in the in the audience so uh we can affect that uh through um as as, as wolfgang said with wnh they have the capabilities of measuring so that's clear um again fine tuning the as, as i've just said for profitability pattern j appears to be consistently the best performing across all tested engravings and that goes across the four plate uh, plate types that we use, or the three plate types that we used, the SIE, DuPont, McDermott, 
Kodak is obviously a different uh, pattern. Um, so that pattern J was was consistently the best across all those plate platforms and both ink types, and at all speeds. So again, there is no golden bullet to say this is the one, but you are going to be in a much closer place if you want to improve your opacity if you go with uh, that pattern J with one of the analogs engravings that we've shown. So with that. And uh, that's me done. Then. Okay. Now we're going to move on to the last poll question. So when you're looking at trying to achieve really high opacities at maximum speeds, what's the bottleneck that you run into in production? Is it unclean printing or misting that you have, or you have to you know frequently clean the plate, uh, or you just if you run at the maximum speed, you, you just can't hit the, the opacity that your customers require. Or could it be you have uh, an issue with uh, the ink not drying well or, or, or the, the solvents that are all in there? So let's take a look at the results we see coming in from everybody. I guess uh, not surprisingly, when we start to look at this, uh, when people are trying to hit high opacities at maximum speeds, they, they really suffer from a little bit of all of A, B, and C uh, as a challenge. It's interesting for us to, to see, I think for everyone else too, who's, who's out there trying to struggle every day to, to hit these, these numbers. And of course, brand owners get more and more demanding all the time. I think one of the interesting things that came through for this, and, and if people wanna see a print sample, please let us know, is I think we had this kind of theory and, and being involved in, in flexo and screening and, and plate making for so long, uh, we kind of had this thing that you have like a pattern, it works or it doesn't work, right? Or this plate is good or it's not good or, you know, something else. And and these things do all fit together. And it, it is, it's key to try and tune these for your own environment. And the ink drying is, is a critical part. How you control that ink through the press is a critical part. The consistency of, of everything else is all part of that is really, really, really also important. And uh, again, we actually did 36 different print tests with all these different plates. Uh, we did a ton of measurements as every single patch was measured under conditions with different people so that we were able to cross reference those. Uh, we use industry standards, the Lynetta cards when we were doing these these measurements. Uh, and then we went through to take pictures of all of these as well to take a look at all of them. So it was a, it's a massive job, but coming back, I think it's interesting really for people uh, in production to try and see how do these things start to fit together? Where can we start to shortcut some of the testing we might need to do in our own production environment? Uh, but let's actually move on to our last section, which is to get some questions from you. So we're happy to take whatever questions. I'm sure we already have quite a few popping in here. Uh, let's, let's see, one of, the, one of the interesting ones is uh, coming in. So what's the minimum amount of ink in kilos white ink that's needed to start running a press? I don't know. So we've already seen uh, an answer. Uh, depending on the press, I guess, uh, Wolfgang, that's going to be slightly different depending on the press press itself. Yes, can you hear me? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, for standards, um, we are talking about 10 up to 12 kilogram uh, because the index are more normally in the upper positions for white. The question was targeting to white. And uh, for special solutions, you can achieve lower volumes. Um, but you have to be carefully, uh, you have to have the double checks the viscosities. You have to uh, see uh, that you want to wash the ink decks. You need a little bit of performance in the ink decks. So the minimum uh, amounts are around 10 kilograms. Okay. And uh, the next one is, is going to be for you, Colin, I think. And it says that if you increase the viscosity uh, of the white, could that also improve uh, the opacity? Maybe is the answer, uh, but also, you know, when you go at a higher viscosity, it doesn't mean you empty the analogs any better. 
So quite often, if you increase the viscosity, you can actually end up with a lower coating weight because the ink doesn't transfer as well. Yeah. Uh, we have another interesting. Yeah. Go ahead, no, Charles. I was going to say, does Nick agree? Uh, Nick, you're on mute, I think. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's, it's it's getting the balance right. It's getting uh, getting the, the that performance correct. I mean, at the end of the day, you want the ink to, ink to transfer well, and yeah. quite often that's at a lower viscosity, not a higher viscosity. Yeah. And also, your solve your solvent blend that you use as well will help it wet out more on the surface of a, on the surface of a plate or or not. If you if you're using just straight ethyl acetate, for example, you know it's a very fast drying um, acetate. As opposed to a, a, um, uh, a propanol acetate, which will kind of sweeten the ink and, and let it lay down a little bit better. So the, the solvent balance is also key. Yeah. All right. There's a, there's another question. Uh, I think this will also be for uh, for Colin, and it's about the use of uh, polyurethane inks. That seems to be more people are looking towards those. Is, is there a, a big advantage in the in the polyurethane inks? Yeah. Good question. Uh, I mean, the, the simple answer is the polyurethane technology gives you better lamination performance. But the, the more detailed explanation is probably more interesting because, because polyurethane has higher heat stability, so the polyurethane resins are stable at very high temperatures, it means for the first time you can actually do things like retort packaging, sterilization packaging, flexo, because historically all that work was done gravure and the inks used were basically ethyl acetate based, which could not be printed flexo. So, you know, the polyurethane technology opens the door for very high performance flexo applications. And it's, it's here for the future. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, Another question coming in. I think this is going to be for you, uh, Wolfgang. It's about the the ink cooling system and, and how does that impact uh, the solvent consumption? Yes, this is an interesting uh, situation. For my uh, knowledge, it's, uh, it's an uh, indirect cost driver. The process solvent is running and running, and when the bucket is empty, you uh, fill it up. When you have a condition in the printing department, let me say around 35 degrees, and it is realistic in summer in a lot of regions, you can save up to 30% processed uh, process solvents uh, because uh, you cool down the situation to 20, 25 degrees, and the evaporation rate is helpful for this, uh, and then you can save a lot of money. So it is a hidden cost driver. Uh, and then another question, I'm not sure if that's going to be for Colin or for Wolfgang, but do you, do you know what the viscosity was that we were running uh, on the press when we did the print test? I think we'll have to double check. I think 18. 18, okay. 18 and Dean Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's an, another question here, and it said, which plate was the best? Uh, that's, I, I don't think there's a... An easy answer for that because we do see or we saw with the different plates that uh, you know one pattern might be better on plate A versus plate B, uh, and there is a little bit of difference in in what you see uh, from the abs absolute I would say top 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 results. But really, I think for a lot of companies, uh, being able to run a white ink what the, the standard plate they use in production would be a huge advantage. Uh, also for pre-press companies that they're actually don't have to use a separate plate for the white, they can keep using the same plates. Uh, and, and it's going to change a little bit uh, depending on, you know, your analogs, your ink, uh, everything else that's that's part of that. I don't think there was one that said this is absolutely a, a clear winner when it comes to that. Right, and I think to, to be fair, the, the plate type, we've just listed in this presentation the manufacturer, but the plate type that was used, the viscosity that was used, all of these uh, process control elements are recorded and uh, documented. Also the ink type, which are uh, will form part of a white paper that we create. 
And I got another interesting question, and I'm not sure who to give this to. So, is there a way we could compare the white ink coverage that we're getting here to what you might see with silk screen? I think uh, I'll give everyone a chance if they if they want to talk. I think mainly there's there's two things you can you can look at. One is purely an opacity measurement. That's that's a a very simple comparison, and I say simple because that doesn't take into account uh, the homogeneity of, of the ink laid down on the material itself. There are some devices that are available now to take a picture of the actual prints and try and look at the noise in the image to try and give you a value around the homogeneity of the ink. But I don't think there's a standard way to do that. I Colin, you have a... Well, I, mean, I, I don't know how we would measure, uh, but the reality is that silk screen is putting down five or six times the coating weight we are trying to put down in Flexo. So the coating weight difference comparison is massive. Yeah. I, I think especially for white, it's the best function that you use the inline spectral uh, measurement system what some uh, customers uh, um, have in action with this spectral photometer you cannot uh, see only the deviations of the colors you can measure with the WH system also the opacities during the produ production and during the pre speed press up and ramp down situations and you see exactly what is happening there. Thanks. Just looking for a couple more questions that have been uh, popping up here. There's another question of the best way to handle uh, the wiping on recycled materials. Recycled plastics. I mean, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, the, the fact that it's a whiting is not really the, the critical factor. You know, the titanium dioxide or the pigments doesn't play a massive part. It's more the chemistry of the ink. So it's the technology of the ink system that plays a part in, in mechanical recycling. So you need to focus on the chemistry rather than the pigments. I mean, it, Studies have been done at looking at different chemistries. There's a lot more work ongoing. Uh, we contribute with organizations like CFLEX to better understand the interaction between ink and printing, because obviously coating weights play a part uh, on recycled material. Hope that answers it. Yeah, and I have a, another question here coming in more about the, uh, the actual screen patterns themselves. I'll, I'll hand that over to Mark DeMay. Mark, is there uh, anything special that, that somebody would need to be able to try and test these different patterns? Uh, to, to be able to make the plate yourself, uh, uh, the, to create the screen patterns, uh, for all, for what was it, seven out of the eight patterns you need, you, uh, let's say a standard CDI can do that. Uh, CTP device, but uh, especially well, for one reason or another, the J pattern, which came out as best for that one, you need the what we call the pixel boost uh, technology, which is like uh, some kind of machine command to boost the pixel to create, well, in this case, as you, we've seen, ideal cells. Uh, so uh, it's important to know that you need the uh, definitely you will need the CDI with the pixel boost option. And then what we advise, but you know, it's still debatable whether this is really needed or not. We have the the, the most consistent result when we are using the uh, UV LED exposure, uh, which is uh, done by our XPS. So, well, there are also some competitive devices that uh, use UV LED, which we see uh, that provide more consistent uh, cells or, or shapes. But uh, yeah, that's still debatable whether you really need those or that high efficiency uh, tube lights can, can do the same thing. Thanks, Mark. Uh, 
we had another question about can can we share the, the, the more information about the ink type you use, the actual clay types, everything else? Yeah, I think Nick mentioned that we're uh, preparing a, a white paper uh, to send out about all the different uh, results we got from the different plate types, ink types, print speeds, everything else. Uh, really interesting, I think, for everyone in the industry. So uh, at the minute, uh, I don't see any more questions uh, popping up. And I think we're a little bit over time. Yeah, that, again, Nick? There was just one there that is, uh, <clears throat> what is the wet ink transfer percentage from analux to surface? And uh, oh, yeah. wet ink of volume is transferred. As, a, as we discussed in, in the presentation, the cell shape and the depth and, uh, and, and the plate and the whole process itself will determine if you, uh, what percentage gets transferred. Um, all you can do from an analog perspective is to focus on the optimum shape for evacuation and the optimum shape for, 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 for printability and cleaning, which is, you know, there, there is a defined um depth to open into cell wall ratio and if that's maintained and kept then you're going to evacuate or offer the best um amount of a percentage of that ink to the plate the plate has to then want to receive it and the surface patterns change the surface tension so again you will get different uh, different amounts that get transferred through and also the substrate and the treatment level of the substrate or you know there's nothing within this that is singular that you can put onto what will what will that analogs give me here what will that ink give me here in the end the whole point of this um, um project and and, uh, and and team of people is to is to focus in and um and and help understand that look this is a combination it isn't it isn't a single product it's uh, that's the whole uh, to to get to the right results so hopefully that answers this uh, and if I may add just one small comment, the the question about you know uh, when we compared against the silk screen, I think uh, it's for many people clear that the scope of this was on uh, let's say wide web flexibles, and their silk screen is not really like uh, an alternative. Otherwise, you have that uh, this this valid would this question would be valid for a narrow web and UV ink, where on those uh, label presses sometimes you have. Uh, screen groups and they can uh, they can be used to uh, get a serious ink lay down but uh, i don't think to my knowledge on these uh, ci presses uh, uh, for flexor presses and with solvent ink that is uh, not uh, not the case but uh, your wolfgang can correct me on that uh. no uh, you're right okay yep all right I think important is what is the volume what you have to consent and what is the opacity what you achieve on the substrate in percent. And this ratio you can uh, translate very easily when you know uh, what is the wet consumption and the dry performance in percent. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, I'm going to give you one more slide to let you see if you want to contact any of the people that have been on here today. Uh, here are their contact details. Again, you will also see that uh, in a few minutes as we uh, wrap everything up. After we finish the webinar, you'll get a link uh, to the recording that you can, you can go back and, and watch. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for the questions uh filling in the polls and following this we're in working hard to finish off that white paper and uh if there's any other things that you think you'd like to hear or see us do around the white and more with the, the quality on white with printed graphics or whatever let us know because we're always happy to tackle those challenges it, it's been interesting to, to actually go through this as part of uh the follow-up from our last white webinar I think I also think that it's it's fair to say, look, it's it's not only white focused. Yeah, it could be anything to do with the print process. Could be anything to do with uh, a press or a, or a plate or an ink or an analog or a tape. Yeah, in the end, we're uh, you know it's it's a um, an open forum 
that um, is there to support with with a um, a collective answer to uh, to to problems of today or you know developments for the future. That's uh, that's where we we're, we're trying to um, support the industry. All right. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you uh, for our next webinar.